The best picture this year will also be the funniest. Good night, sugar. Good night, honey. There's one thing sure, boy never met girl like this before. You've never laughed more at sex or a picture about it. You stay here as long as you like. Jack may have beaten Tony to the sugar, but not for long. Hear Marilyn sing the fabulous songs of the Roaring Twenties on the United Artists soundtrack album. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Everybody and welcome back to another edition of Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen Lopez, joined not by Emily. She is thankfully in a new house, so hopefully she will be back on soon. We have another amazing guest host joining us today to kick off a new month and honoring the anniversary of Marilyn Monroe, Tony Curtis, and Jack Lemons. Some like it hot, and that guest is my friend and author, Alisa Jordan. Alisa, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for wanting to talk about this movie. You are the author Always. of Hello, Norma Jean, the Marilyn Monroe you didn't know. So I'm really excited to, for you to tell us stuff about Marilyn that I didn't know from this movie. Well, the way I wanted to look at Marilyn is what was she like as a real person? Because we know a lot of the facts about her and she was born and when she died and the movies and when they came out and that kind of thing. And I get asked a lot, well, what was she really like? And what did she eat? And what was her size? So I instead took a different look at her life and kind of broke things down by topic rather than a chronological biography. And I put her in context of the city. I, that's how I opened the book, what was going on in Los Angeles during her lifetime, so that you can see what she was surrounded by and how that might affect her. That was the start of it. And then I get into a lot of myth busting because with someone as famous as Marilyn, who didn't have a family left behind to protect her legacy, a lot of stories have come up that just aren't true. And some are silly, like she had a sixth toe, which you can plainly see she did not have. Some are more serious that might hurt her credibility, such as affairs with the Kennedy brothers, that was one of the main things. There's no evidence of any affair with either Kennedy brother. I'm excited to start diving into all of that. I love that people want to know what she ate because, <laughs> you know, I don't know what Marilyn Monroe ate. I'm excited to find that out. <laughs> when she was really watching her weight, she did what we would now call a high protein diet. So she was a little ahead of her time in that regard. So she would eat eggs or steak, that kind of thing. And then when she was a little more relaxed, she liked Mexican food. She was reasonably fit most of her life. She has a reputation for being plus size, and there's certainly nothing wrong with being plus size, but she was actually quite tiny. When she was on Catalina Island in her teens with her first husband, Catalina at the time had been turned into a training camp for soldiers going off to World War II. So she was stationed there with her husband. There was a former Olympian on the island who was training the soldiers. And she went to him and learned some basic weight training exercises. She was a teenager at the time. And she employed that the rest of her life. So she learned as a teen health and fitness from an Olympian, which... Not many people even today would have access to that. You can access that maybe online, but certainly not in person. She got really lucky and she utilized a lot of his tips and techniques for the rest of her life. That's amazing. I'm so excited to start getting into this with you. But before we get into Some Like It Hot, Marilyn Monroe, we'd just like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, then you should. We do all sorts of additional bonus content, including our series double features, looking at remakes based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime. It's also going to be the location where you can see my upcoming interview with Dave Carger talking about his new book, 50 Oscar Nights. We also give out regular care packages of movies, gifts, and let you guest on an episode. That's at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget that 
I have a book out, but have you read the book, 52 Literary Gems That Inspired Our Favorite Movies, as well as Emily has books, her Viviana Valentine series. You can order those wherever you get books. And our Redbubble store always has some fabulous art designed by our former host, Samantha Richardson, as well as the amazing artist, Terrence Hilt, featuring your favorite stars, including our popular Gene Kelly, Judy Garland, Makoko mugs. You can find that at ticklishbiz.redbubble.com. So let's get into Some Like It Hot. I didn't want to make this an all Marilyn Monroe episode, but what I was noticing watching the trailer for this movie is that the trailer pretty much says this is a Marilyn (laughs) Monroe movie and the other guys are just along for the ride. If you've not seen Some Like It Hot and the movie is turning 65 this year, so you should probably watch it. It is the incomparable tale of... Two musicians, played by Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon, who witness the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and decide to go on the run. And the only way they can do that is by joining a girls' music group and dressing in drag. They rebrand themselves as Josephine and Daphne and decide to join this band where they both fall for the lovable sugar played by marilyn monroe a lot of stuff that we are now considering ahead of its time with regards to lgbtq representation and trans representation all of that is cemented here in 1959 alisa i know that there's a lot of back and forth about what this movie meant to marilyn's career at the time how vital was this movie to her career in 1959 Very. It starts off, you have to back up a little bit. She was married to Arthur Miller, and he was accused of, like a lot of artists at the time, having communist ties. He was called to testify in front of the House on Un-American Activities. He refused to name names. He said, I'll tell you whatever you want to about myself. I went to a couple meetings. It wasn't for me and I moved on, but I'm not going to sell out anyone else. And that risked his career. It also risked Marilyn's career because she supported him. So neither one of them were able to work through 1957 and 1958. Prince and the Showgirl was released in 1957, but it had been filmed in 1956. What's interesting about that is it really goes to show you how those committees were seeking publicity because they didn't go after Arthur Miller until he was with Marilyn Monroe, who was a big name. And that's when they really went after him. She supported him. 20th Century Fox basically told her, we're not going to touch you until this is resolved because your career might be over. So neither one of them were working and they needed money because that ended up in a court battle. The Millers had to pay pretty high legal bills, of course. So not only were they not working, they depleted a lot of their savings. When Marilyn had been presented Some Like It Hot, she didn't want to take the movie because she felt like this was another dumb blonde role. And if you back up again a few years, she had gone on strike, again risking her career, because she wanted better roles. She was tired of playing dumb blondes because she realized that Not only was she not stretching her acting ability, she kept saying, I want to be a great actress, but people were starting to believe that she really was a dumb blonde in real life. And that was just unacceptable to her. She was very sensitive to how people saw her. So when Billy Wilder came to her with some like it hot, she said, I'm not interested. It was actually Arthur Miller who read the script and told her, This is not just any script. This is a masterpiece. You should really consider doing this. She took him seriously, to her credit. She reconsidered and saw that Arthur was right. And she also realized, we just need the money. Those were the reasons she took the movie. When the movie came out in 1959, she got some of the biggest accolades of her career. And she was thrilled. So it is a huge boon to her career in that respect too because she got a golden globe nomination and won for best actress in a comedy 
there's pictures of her after she received her award just hugging that trophy because she finally felt validated and vindicated for all the hard work she had done going on strike, studying at the actor's studio, taking private lessons from Lee Strasberg. She finally got the recognition she had been craving and she got it through Some Like It Hot. I don't think it can be discounted what she brings to the film. I love this movie. This movie is a classic for a reason. It's no. often cited on one of the funniest movies ever made lists. And all of that is valid. But that doesn't work without Marilyn Monroe. And I know that Billy Wilder was saying that Mitzi Gaynor was who they initially had in mind. They didn't even think they could get Marilyn Monroe for this movie, which I don't know how true that was or if Billy was just taking the piss. But you need a sugar that is... Not necessarily dumb, and I don't think the character is dumb. She's been so screwed over by men, which yeah. was very much Marilyn, I would say, in many regards. She has that great speech in the movie where she's telling Tony Curtis's Joe about how she always gets the fuzzy end of the lollipop, the rolled up tube of toothpaste. Everybody just uses her up, and then they disappear. And she knows that she's not bright because she keeps looking for the same type of guy knowing what is going to happen. That's a really astute self-analysis for a character that they didn't have to give her. She no, plays it right. so well. You're absolutely right. And you know, what's interesting about that and what makes her relatable is how many women have gone through that. And I'm sure men too. It's just, I happen to view life through the eyes of a woman. But, As we do. You know, <laughs> uh, when she's talking about herself, it's not so much that she's dumb. She just falls into patterns, which we all do, whether it's about our love life or something else. She is one of those characters who doesn't give herself enough credit. But at the same time, she is very good at her insight into what people are. Although they're all tricked by Josephine and Daphne. So you can't blame her for that because they all are you can correct me if i'm wrong but i had always heard that this was a hard shoot for her because it was she had had a miscarriage if memory served she was pregnant on set. okay by this point with the style of method acting that the strasbergs taught they encouraged their actors to get analysis that's what it was called then now we have so much better therapy. But back then it was very Freudian and they would have you talk about your trauma, but they wouldn't really give you the tools to fix it. So basically she had reopened all this childhood trauma and she was trying very hard to start a family. She had had a miscarriage in the past and she wanted a family very much. And as much as I hate to say this, but her doctors had prescribed medications for her that were now working against her. That was an issue. So it was a very hard shoot for her physically, emotionally. And then she just had general anxiety on the set anyway. She never felt like she was good enough. So it was very hard to work with her. It was very hard for her. Jack Lemon, to his credit, was very diplomatic about it. He just met her where she was at and accepted her. Tony Curtis had a much harder job because he worked with her more. He was her leading man, and he found it very difficult to work with her. And of course, later on said some very unflattering things about her that I think he regretted and tried to take back. He even went so far as to say he was the father of the baby Marilyn was carrying on the set of the movie, which no one believes, by the way. <laughs> but he realized how harsh she had been. But to her credit, she was trying. To his credit, she was very hard to work with, and it was just a hard shoot for everyone. I was doing some research. He wrote in his memoirs, I believe it was, that they had this affair and that he got threatened yeah. <laughs> to stay away from her. They had to be professionals, which is hilarious because decades after this, he said how awful she was to work with and that he hated being around her and she wasn't that talented. So. This is just your reminder that Tony Curtis was kind of horrible. But you wouldn't see any of it on the screen because they no. also have such a great chemistry. 
when he's both Josephine and when he's also Junior, the shell oil heir that he's trying to <laughs> trick her into believing that he is. And, and Joe. And Joe. He's playing three yeah. different types of characters in this movie. They're Things, great together. They're so great together. They are so great. His character starts out as this womanizer, very much like Tony Curtis. I mean, if you want to say that Marilyn Monroe only played Marilyn Monroe, Tony Curtis often only played Tony Curtis, in my opinion. Not a whole lot of range there. When he gets involved with these women, this is a sex comedy, as far as I'm concerned. A very early oh, yeah. sex comedy. Where Daphne, where Jack Lemon plays the character as <laughs> just borderline, just right to the end of Lecherous. Joe is a bit more reserved, and if anything... His character does go through this transformation. By the end of the movie, he's telling her, I'm no good for you. I'm the horrible guy that you keep talking about all the time. And she's like, I don't care. But he does have that moment of introspection where he mm -hmm. wonders what he can offer her, which I appreciate. And the scenes where they're on the boat and he's told her that he can't fall in love. He's got essentially, you no. Know, he's asexual. She's uh -huh. trying to seduce him. We'll talk about some of the physical comedy in this movie, but... They do have such a wonderful chemistry, and it's always jarring to realize how much he talked bad about her after the fact. And you're right about the script. It is very layered, and I think that's what Arthur Miller was responding to when he read the script and said, no, this is special. These are well-developed characters. And it's one of the things that, not to bring up Andrew Dominic's travesty of a movie, Blonde, but it's one <laughs> of the things that I hate. One of many things I hate about Blonde is that there's a sequence where they are filming some Like It Hot and Anna de Armas's Marilyn Monroe is having, she's wearing a recreation of the Ori Kelly dress and she's having this meltdown on stage about one of the lines from earlier in the movie and she's scratching her face all up. I hate it. I hate that movie so much and I hate what it does for this movie by making me think of that movie. The thing about Anna de Armas, we know that she's really good at crying on screen, but there's really no character development in that movie. All Marilyn does is it goes from scene to scene to scene where Marilyn just melts down. How did you get a nomination? It wasn't her fault. She did the best she could with the material, but there was no character growth. There was no yeah. character arc. There was nothing. It was just Marilyn comes into a scene, something terrible happens, and she starts screaming and crying. That was the entire three hours, and it was agonizing to watch. It is agonizing. You can listen to our non-three-hour episode, Looking at Blonde. It's on our Patreon, if anybody wants to hear our thoughts on, my thoughts at least, on that monstrosity of a movie. We talked about Billy Wilder and IAL Diamond's script. Billy Wilder and Marilyn had worked previously on The Seven-Year Itch, which is a movie I enjoy a lot, but... Weirdly enough, I don't consider that Marilyn's movie. I consider that more Tom Yule's movie just because yeah, yeah. she's the girl. She, does, she doesn't even actually have a she name in that movie. A, she doesn't have a name. She's just the girl. So I love that we come full circle and give her a bit of characterization. You also have Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis as our leads. This movie is a gangster picture, really, if you think about it, which was something Billy Wilder added. This was originally based on a, a novel from so far. They didn't actually even have a copy of it. I think they had to get an international copy outside of the country it was already written in. I think it was German. And so they adapted it. Billy Wilder added the St. Valentine's Day element to it. What's so skillfully done, and we've seen movies do drag something like white chicks or whatnot. You've seen mm -hmm. men go undercover as women before. And yet here, it's so oddly specific in the fact that they are a girl group of musicians. Mm -hmm. Just right off the bat, when they assume this is going to be some sort of easy thing, they just dress up as women, they hop off in another town and they can move on with their lives. And when they get on that train and they meet the women that are there, they're like, this is a classy, sophisticated outfit. And the women all immediately start talking about, take off your girdle. They drink. <laughs> they're having a huge party in the berths of the train. The movie really is looking at the ways that men have this presumption of what women are and mm -hmm. upends it by having them infiltrate those spaces. 
this could very well be, and other movies did it later, this really skeezy story of two dudes that infiltrate women's spaces and just use it for quick sex. Which, don't get me wrong, Daphne kind of does that at the beginning and tries to at least... Tries. Tries. Fails horribly, but tries. It's the fact that they are realizing that all their beliefs about women are incorrect without drawing attention to it. The movie doesn't say these things out loud, but it's the fact that these women are, as the song goes, running wild. I love that. That's what keeps it fresh. It's made in 59, but it's still so relevant to today. And you know, when they had a test screening of it, people showed up to watch another movie. And as the lights went down, they announced, sorry, folks, we're not going to show you the movie that you paid to see. We're going to show you this movie you've never heard of because we want your honest opinions of it. So it was a surprise test screening. People walked out because it was, there were kids in the audience. So parents were walking their kids out, but it was men living as women. It wasn't just men dressing up as women and ha ha, it's funny, like Milton Berle had done. It was very clear that he was a man dressed as a woman and that's the punchline. No, these men were passing as women and infiltrating women's spaces. And that was offensive to some people. Now, that reaction did not last because Some Like It Hot went on to great praise and did very well at the Golden Globes, and Jack Lemmon was nominated for an Oscar. But the initial reaction was shock. I could definitely believe that. I know they said that if you saw the color photos of Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis, that you would be horrified because there was absolutely no way they would have passed. That's right. the story goes that part of why it's filmed in black and white is so it that is you- why it's filmed in black and white. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I don't know if I'm buying that they can pass even in black and white, but I understand why. I mean, Marilyn Monroe's always had a very big LGBTQ following, mm-hmm. but I can see why this movie is often elevated as an early for 1959 exploration of transgenderism because these two characters are living their lives as women and being accepted in these spaces we'll talk about the end that famous last line with jack and joey brown pretty much says that there's nothing wrong with it which i can only imagine what 1959 audiences felt with that final line you know what's funny to me my favorite couple in the movie is joey brown who plays osgood And Daphne, yeah, they that's are couples happy. goals they right there. <laughs> they are happy. They're having a great time. He is taking excellent care of her. He wants to give her this <laughs> grand life, and he called Mama, and she's excited. <laughs> it's another example too of the transformation of the script, right? Joey Brown's character is this womanizer. He talks about how he's such a bad, bad boy. He's (laughs) whining and dining all these women and no woman is stuck. No woman's been able to tame him. Daphne does. She (laughs) totally is able to convince him that he should stop playing the field and settle (laughs) down. It's why that ending, and I don't want to jump into it right now, but I think it's why that ending is not only so iconic, but again, from an LGBTQ perspective, just feels so progressive in the sense, and we'll talk about it in a second, but there's so many good performers in this, big and small. Have you joined Ticklish Business Patreon yet? You should, just like Allie Moore, Amy Hart, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Gates, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Krista Painter, McGeff, and Rachel Clark. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, watch exclusive video interviews, receive merch, and even guests on an episode. You also get access to bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Double Features, and our latest series, But Have You Read? The Series. It all starts at just $1 at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. We talked about Tony Curtis and Marilyn. I can see why Jack Lemmon got the Oscar. It's a showy oh, role, mm-hmm. but it's so perfect. It is so perfect for him. And this was the first time him and Wilder had worked together. I know they had the apartment. He's brilliant in that, too. Pretty sure this was their first team up. And Daphne is my favorite character because... She's mine, too. She she, kind of steals it. She so steals it because she is definitely... Everybody's met that girl. I've been a... I'm a Daphne a time or two that's just, like, trying so hard 
to integrate into the community <laughs> and it's just failing horribly that sequence on the train where he thinks that he's going to try to make time with sugar and invites mm -hmm. her to his birth it eventually transforms into every woman bringing all sorts of different items to they're on a moving train and like a train birth and mm -hmm. looks huge on screen but they're literally like do we have vermouth? If we do, we can make Manhattans. And if we have this, where are the ice cubes? They have a hot water bottle that's mm -hmm. filled with alcohol. Seeing Jack Lemon in this tiny space with the amount of women in this I, I would love to have sat down with Billy Wilder and asked him how he filmed all of that because yeah. I don't know how they pull it off. And it all culminates with Somebody having a corkscrew and Jack Lemon just screaming, watch that corkscrew. <laughs> it is a masterpiece of comedy. Once they get to the Hotel Coronado, which is probably the most famous location in movie dumb, thanks to this movie, one of them at least, the movie changes because they can't just stay as women throughout the film, although Daphne does stay that way pretty much throughout the entire movie, but Joe decides to because he knows sugar wants a man with money and stability so he starts impersonating junior the shell oil heir yeah it does create this animosity between the two friends where daphne wants sugar for herself and also it's wrong so he he's like i'm gonna tell there is a scene that i quote all the time when it's that first introduction to joe with that Cary grant accent which Cary grant yeah. took massive umbrage with said he didn't talk like that he kind of did. Sugar starts utilizing all of the facts that J Josephine and Daphne have told her about their life and utilizing it as hers. So she went to Bryn Mawr and he says, <laughs> I knew a girl from Bryn Mawr. She huh? squealed on her roommate and was killed with her own brassiere. It's <laughs> hilarious. But you never lose sight of the friendship between the two, uh -huh. between Joe and Jerry throughout the whole movie, even when they're just constantly trying to one-up each other. But Jack Lemon's just eagerness and his constant smile on his face as he's trying to pull one over on these women and it's just not working mm -hmm. is so infectious. When he comes on the train, hi, Daphne, the new bass fiddle. They're presented as like conservatory women from the, yeah. what is it, the Sheboygan School of yeah. Music. It goes to show that gender rules are just upturned left and right in this movie because... They present themselves a certain way because they think that's what women are. And then they get on the train and and they're drinking and getting undressed and throwing parties and making dirty jokes. You have all of this femininity contrasted with the gangsters who are just the apotheosis of machismo led by George Raft, who at this point was not George Raft of the 1930s, this matinee idol figure. He was just stuck playing these kinds of characters from what I've researched. This really did kind of give him a second wind. It's almost like Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard in terms of mm -hmm. reminding you of how good an actor George Raft is. And yet the gangster plot is probably the weakest element. It brings the third act together, but I don't think anybody actually has any love lost for that plot. They had to have it because that's why they're dressed as women. And then they had to bring it back around at the end so that they have to all run away together. So there's that element, but the meat of the movie and the genius of the movie, the heart of the movie is the middle when we see these two men living as women, learning what it's like to be a woman, and that's causing them to reevaluate what they're like as men and passing as women and Sugar falling in love with what she thinks is a millionaire and thinking that's what she wants and it's not. It's just brilliantly written. It really is. I did want to ask you, you talked about upending some of the rumors that have mm -hmm. been associated with her. And it's often said that Marilyn Monroe on this film, and we've even seen it in some of the biopics that they've done about scenes from this movie, is that how many takes she needed to say really simple lines. So like famously, it took her 47 takes to say, it's me, sugar. And uh, it took 40 takes for her to say, where's the bourbon? And they had to write the line in every drawer because she wasn't opening the right drawer. How true were those stories? Those rumors are pretty true. That scene on the boat where Junior and Sugar, where she's trying to seduce him and he's trying very hard to pretend like it's not working and he's eating, what was it? 
it was chicken in real life, but it was chilled pheasant or something in the movie. And he had to keep eating bite after bite after bite because she kept blowing her line. And he even told a story later where when they're on that yacht, she points to a stuffed fish and she says, what is it? That's the line, right? But she forgot the line. So she points to the fish and kind of mutters to Tony Curtis, Tony, what is it? And he said, what's what? And she said, what's the line? And he said, what is it? Because that was the line. And so it turns into this who's, who's on, on first, first? thing. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, yeah, what is it? And he's like, it's, it's what is it? She kept forgetting her lines over and over and over again. And that tried the patience of everyone on the set because she would be late to the set and then she would struggle remembering her lines. You would never know when you watch the movie that there was any trouble at all. And that's a credit to everyone who worked on the movie. Marilyn's performance was amazing. Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis were amazing. And then you really have to hand it to Billy Wilder for keeping it together on the set. Now, he lost his temper quite a bit after the movie because he got into a telegram war with Arthur Miller because Billy Wilder did say it was hard working with Marilyn and Arthur Miller came to Marilyn's defense. But it was hard working with Marilyn. What I appreciate so much about her films, and we've done a whole episode about Marilyn Monroe's work in the 1960s. This is the start of it in 59. Mm -hmm is that even though she was struggling so much personally, the late 1950s into the 1960s, it's unfortunate that it really is this flowering of something new in her mm -hmm. career. And this is really the start of it. She's still in that wheelhouse of the breathy voice. You have all the Marilynisms, mm -hmm. And yet the character is so much more developed than some of mm -hmm. her past characters. And that would continue into her later 1960s films, which I always appreciate. I do want to shout out those Ori Kelly dresses. We don't talk enough <laughs> about fashion on this show, in my opinion. And these costumes are just on another level of perfection. Mm -hmm. Even the Daphne and Josephine costumes, you know, they put them in a lot of furs and they said that they had to have a cabaret dancer teach Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis how to walk in high heels. Yeah. which I can only imagine how that went. But for me, it's all about Marilyn's musical sequence dresses that Ori Kelly designed. And some of them just stretch the bounds of, I'm sure, what the code was yeah. willing to accept in 1959. Specifically, that dress she wears at the very end that is the nude bodysuit almost, where she's mm -hmm. just got the spangles <laughs> covering her boobs. It's a master of construction because she's clearly not wearing a bra. Because it's backless as well, so you can see mm -hmm. the back. The back cuts so deep to, like, just the top of her rump. It is, again, a masterpiece of dress construction. I know they call her Jello on Springs in this movie, but honestly, that dress goes in the Hall of Fame as one of those dresses that I constantly wonder how it stays in place, how it stays up. I don't understand it. I probably never will, but it is magic. <laughs> He won the Academy Award for those costumes. Deservedly so. so. He deserved that award because not only did he make Marilyn look like Marilyn, the movie star she was, but he had to make Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon look at least somewhat believable as women. Think how hard that would be. They said that Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon would go around the lot while they were doing their makeup tests and whatnot and go into the women's bathroom and start doing their makeup. And they claim no woman ever looked askance at them. I don't know how true that is. But... I don't know how true that is. I'd have to see it to believe it. Because I have seen the color photos of them and they do not pass well as women. Tony but Curtis to me... just has such a strong jawline. I'm just convinced there's perpetual five o'clock shadow just all the time. Yeah. You can absolutely see the five o'clock shadow on him, even through that thick makeup. It almost makes it funnier in a weird way yeah. for the movie because comedy is exaggerated. So it's okay if they look a little bit like men in the movie. 
maybe the women in the bathroom just weren't paying attention. Maybe all they saw was skirts and heels and they're like, see you ladies. What I think <laughs> that might be some like it's hot's greatest feat is that this is a movie where the women always accept the characters as women. And the men also accept them as women. How many times, even outside of Joey Brown's Osgood, there are men hitting on them throughout this entire movie. There's the bellboy that delivers the stuff to them that's like, hey, Jack Lemon's like, what is happening here? I mean, all of the men accept that they are women. And it, in fact, it's what is it, the end scene when they're running away from the mob and the mobsters are looking for them and what throws them is the heels. That is the film's amazingness is the sense that this is a world where everybody buys what they're selling no questions asked you know what's funny is you can kind of see the change in them starting when they get to florida they get their hotel room daphne comes in and she's furious and says i just got pinched in the elevator and she looks in the mirror and says i'm not even pretty joe <laughs> slash josephine says they don't care as long as you're wearing a skirt yeah that's kind of what it's like, gentlemen. <laughs> exactly. That's why Jack Lemmon got that Oscar nomination. He buys into this so much so that, honestly, I understand why things are written about Daphne as a trans character. Because mm -hmm. Daphne loves being Daphne probably more than Jerry loved being Jerry. She's going out dancing. That dance sequence with her and Osgood... <laughs> It's <laughs> iconic for a reason. The physical bits of business. We talked in the last episode on The Heiress about Ralph Richardson abusing stage business to draw the eye to him. And yet in that dance sequence, the bits of business between Osgood and Daphne just make you draw your attention to both of them as a couple. So the way that the camera is alternating between looking at Daphne's face and looking at Osgood's face. The rose goes from Osgood's mouth <laughs> to Daphne's mouth. It's amazing. And Daphne comes back from that encounter, this date that in love. she's <laughs> Yeah, this date that she's been forced on, completely in love with the Maracas. They're talking about getting married. She's in it. She's in it for the long haul. And, and that's this is what I was going to mention earlier is one of my favorite lines from the movie is when she is lying there on her bed at dawn, she's still shaking her maracas, and Joe comes in, and she tells Joe, I'm engaged. And he said, congratulations, who's the lucky girl? And he just smiles and says, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a movie that starts with him having to say to himself in the birth, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, to try to will himself to not be a man. And yet, by the end of this movie... He's ready to wear Mama's wedding dress and <laughs> get the jewels and start a family. It is such a subversive. I don't think it gets enough credit for being as subversive as it is at the time, which I don't necessarily think Billy Wilder and IAL Diamond had that intent when they made it. But it really has become in a landscape where if you watch something like The Celluloid Closet and gay people had been demonized, or presented as outsiders and often ended up dying as a result mm -hmm. of that. To watch something like Some Like It Hot that does feel coded for trans people as trans mm -hmm. people, to watch this movie where it ends with everybody happily ever after in some way, that's mm -hmm. really amazing when representation so often says that if you can't confine yourself to the norm, you don't deserve to exist. That's, I think, what puts us in the pantheon of just all-timers. That end line, when he says nobody's perfect, Osgood is accepting Daphne as she is. And Daphne doesn't say yes, but she doesn't say no either and leaves it open-ended for however you want to view it. I appreciate that very much. The acceptance of Osgood is just incredible at the end. The ending is a masterpiece just on its own, but one of the best endings, probably the best ending for me, at least in all of film history. The gangsters are coming for them. They end up on the boat. Osgood has saved the day, essentially. He's yeah. going to get them out of Dodge. Sugar decides to come with them. We didn't talk about this part, but she's performing the sad ballad right beforehand. Mm -hmm. Josephine, as Josephine, shows up and says, no man is worth crying over and kisses her. Now, 
she as thinks that woman. that's a woman she thinks that's uh-huh. a woman kissing her we talked about this a little bit when we talked about victor victoria if you go back mm-hmm. and listen to that episode but there is a moment in victor victoria where the male character knows that julie andrews's character is a woman so mm-hmm. all of his lusting after her at a certain point is with this awareness that he is not gay but in this movie when they kiss She's assuming that a woman has kissed her. She's just kind of like, Josephine. And the way she says the line, I don't know how many takes that took for Marilyn to get right. Mm -hmm. But she says it in a way that's almost like, am I into this? Am I into her? (laughs) Are we into each other? And she goes after her. And of course, Joe has to come clean. She also is like, I don't care. You can do whatever you want. But she has the awareness that he is a man. That relationship is quote unquote, normal status quo Mm -hmm. but at the end when osgood daphne has to tell him try to find some nice way to break his heart what does she go things like can never have children yeah i smoke (laughs) i smoke all the time i don't care i have a horrible past i forgive you i can never have children we'll adopt some (laughs) and then he finally says i'm a man and the line is nobody's perfect honestly at that point i was just like you know what it makes you question how much osgood knew from the get-go. Did he know? <laughs> and he's just like, whatever, this person has tamed me and I'm willing to get married. And honestly, I don't think Mama would have cared either. So that's what I'm saying about this movie being subversive. It's the fact that the movie doesn't end on a freeze frame of Osgood oh, shocked face or something. It's Joey Brown's big blissful smile. <laughs> and Daphne, now Jerry, being like, okay, where is this going to go? And I'd like to think that they just got married and he was living his best life with all of Osgood's millions. You know, what's funny. At the beginning of the movie, I've seen this movie on the big screen many times and it gets a lot of laughs. One of the lines that never gets a laugh, and I don't know why because it's one of my favorites, is when they're first dressing as women and they're having trouble walking in heels and they show up to the train feeling... The manager, the guy, says, are you the two new girls? And Daphne says, brand new. And it just seems to go right over the heads of the (laughs) audience. But that's hilarious. Are you the two new girls? Brand new. I read online that this movie was banned in Kansas, the entire state, because they found cross-dressing, quote, (laughs) too disturbing for Kansans. That sucks for people from Kansas who didn't get to see this movie. The fact that this movie ends with a happy ending question mark at least nobody ends up being gunned down by the mob or anything it is a perfect movie to me it is a perfect film i don't say that often about a lot of things but this movie is just perfect for me at least i don't know overall like is it a perfect movie for you yes and afi american film institute said it was the greatest comedy of all time and i agree i have to take a step back and say i am biased because i personally love the movie i love all the actors in it I sure do think it's incredible. The character development is right on target. The comedy is amazing. The script is tight. Well done, Mr. Diamond and Mr. Wilder. If you want to hear us talk about something like Sunset Boulevard, I also did an episode way back. You can find it on our- Another great movie. Another great, great movie. You can find that on our archives, which are always free at ticklishbusiness.podbean.com. But I'd like to thank Elisa Jordan once again for joining us to talk about this movie. You can buy her book, Hello, Norma Jean, wherever you buy your books. Elisa, you want to throw out where fans can find and get in touch with you, anything you have upcoming? You can find me on Instagram at LA Woman Tours. That's LA underscore woman underscore tours. I'm on Facebook at LA Woman Tours. And I'm also at All Things Maryland podcast. So you can find us online there. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. And we have an Instagram page. So we're talking about Maryland all the time. Again, I'm a little biased when it comes to Maryland, but she's definitely worth investigating on a deeper level. And I hope folks join us. If you have not listened to their podcast, it is a Maryland lover's dream. And your co-host, Scott Fortner, owns the Marilyn Monroe dress from the Prince and the Showgirl, correct? He does. Yeah, he owns one of the largest collections of Marilyn Monroe personally owned items in the world. 
And he is the nicest guy. Feel free to let him know that we would love to have him on the show, if only because (laughs) when we did our fashion episode, which again, you can also listen to if you look at our archive, the Marilyn dress from Prince and the Showgirl is my favorite costume of all time. That dress is iconic. So I'm happy that it's in a safe place, in a good home. He's taking very good care of it. Exactly. Have you seen it in the flesh? Once, yes. (gasps) Jealous. There were five. There were five of those, at least that I know of. I know who has another one. So I've seen that one too. Obviously, they're all identical because she wears that through the majority of the movie. So they would have to change them out. But the two where I know they are and who owns them, they're being taken care of very, very well. And they are in good condition for how old and how fragile they are. I bet. Either way, if I was in their presence, I would probably solve. Like, just (laughs) ugly, sad tears. (laughs) No, ugly, happy tears because they're being taken care of. Yes. And listeners, you can send us your thoughts on Some Like It Hot, Marilyn Monroe, whatever you would like. You can email it to us directly at ticklishbiz at gmail.com. Or you can send it to us via all our social media platforms. We're at Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at ticklishbiz. And also on Twitter, always Twitter, at ticklish underscore biz. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, wherever you get podcasts. Reviews matter, and we would love one this year. So leave us a review on Apple Podcasts of five stars. I am on all social media at Kristen Lopez 88 That's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can find me there. And Emily is always at Ms. Emily Edwards. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content like our upcoming interview with Dave Carter, as well as our March Madness bracket that I'm putting together. So consider helping us out starting at just a dollar at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. You can order my book wherever you get books, as well as Emily's. And please remember, our archive is always free. It's at ticklishbusiness.podbean.com. We will be returning March 27th with a dual centennial tribute to Marlon Brando and Tennessee Williams talking about a streetcar named Desire. Till then. <laughs> <laughs>